So first I want to go ahead and introduce everyone. I'm going to start at the end here. This is Neil Drumming and from a producer from This American Life. Um, next to him is Mark Pai Pagan. Pagan. Okay, Mark Pagan. Um, Brick, Brick Media mm -hmm. and Arts, right? And he runs the um, radio and um, podcasting division. We can say thing. Say? Okay, yeah. Yeah. podcasting thing. <laughs> Yes. yes. All right. Brittany Luce. I keep wanting to say Luce or something, you know, make I it more exotic. Yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> um, from co host of For Call It Nerds Own. No. For Did I nerds. add only? Okay, but not yeah. try. Okay. For Call It Nerds and Gimlet Media. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Carrie Hillman from Story Senior Producer for, for StoryCorp. Okay. Awesome. And. <laughs> Shruti, <a> deep breath. <laughs> Pinamanini. Wow. Okay. Yes. Okay. You're also a senior producer at Gimlet Media. I'm a senior reporter at a, um, okay. Reply All. Okay. Which is at Gimlet Media. Okay. So that's how that goes. All right. All right. See, I'm I'm learning too. I'm learning too. So let's just jump right in with my first question. So really, it's not a question. It's like. Kind of give us like a little bit of background of like how you came to it because everyone came to it from like totally different you know paths if you will. So we'll just start right here with you. Yeah, I man, my path was so confused. Uh, I started, I studied math, like theoretical <laughs> math. I got out a job, I got out of college, and was like, I need a job, and started off in advertising. Um, I was working actually at. Um, Spike Lee has an advertising agency called mm -hmm. Spike DDB, um, where he does urban marketing. Um, and so I was making TV ads for Pepsi, uh, and I was a line producer at the time. And at some point I was like, you know, I could take the stuff that I'm doing for commercials and actually do documentaries. And so I worked in TV documentaries for years, uh, and then I moved out of the country and heard radio. For, for, I heard a podcast. That was my entry way into. I never grew up listening to radio. Heard a podcast because I was living in another country and missing the U.S. Um, and never went back from there. Switched to radio and I need to know yeah. what podcast. <laughs> it's such a cliche. <laughs> I started listening to Radio Up and then okay. to This American Life. But it was relatively recently, so in two thousand eight. All right, thank you. Um, I I actually started at for, in public radio, mm -hmm. so I thought I was going to be a, a long form journalist. That was uh, you know sort of a passion, and then I took one radio class and sort of never looked back. Uh, I fell in love with Pro Tools and editing, and sort of. Got my start in San Francisco, um, started show running there, uh, came to New York to launch Studio 360, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, from there launched another show. Uh, all of these were sort of for big, ne you know, the network, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, big stations, and um, sort of around 2008, all that changed, right? Mm -hmm. There was the, the economy tanked and shows were being cut left and right, and um, it was a great time to get into podcasting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, started doing some podcasting. Uh, uh, I guess I could name a few of them. So with the truth, did a few for Panoply, which is Slate Magazine. Um, one was <laughs> for the New York Times, and one was for uh, another author of a book called Quiet. Um, and uh, the truth, which is a uh, sort of storytelling for your ears, which I think might be really relevant in this room. Mm -hmm. um, and now I am at StoryCorp, which is uh, sort of has a kind of a dual purpose. It's sort of telling uh, everyday people's stories, uh, and it's, it's it has a very strong oral history component. So all of the stories are archived at the Library of Congress. So. Very cool. I took a really long time. I'm old. Oh, yeah. I think also, yeah. The, this vent is like oof, killing us. Are, are the radio people? Yes, exactly, the exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's like ah, uh, you can't turn it. Believe me, we already looked to see if we could turn it off. Is this working? Hello, hello. 
No? Yes. Oh, is it a mic for the camera? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, so these are not. I thought they're, they're mics for they're the just, camera. Right? They're just for the camera? Oh, yeah. We'll okay. talk louder. Is we'll this better? Talk louder. Is this yes. better? Radio yes. voices. Really loud. <laughs> um, so I got started. I happened to get into podcasting. Uh, I have a degree in film from Howard University. And Woo. then, yes, yeah. <laughs> but then I graduated in the spring. No, that's a lie. I graduated in, at the end of the summer of 2009, and the economy was really bad. And so I like did all sorts of random jobs between 2009 and 2014. So I like worked in Nordstrom at the lingerie department, I nannied a lot, I coached high school sports. I worked for the government of the city of Detroit. I did literally anything that you could cross. I lived at home with my parents. Hmm. For a while, I did a whole bunch of different stuff, and then um, I like moved here, did all this other stuff, and then I was, was working at a, I can barely remember what it was, but it was like very dry, boring corporate job, and I wasn't a very good employee. And my best friend from Howard, Eric, he was like, "We should start a podcast," and I was like, "Why would we do that? <laughs> like, who who listens to podcasts?" And um, and then he, and then we just started it, and then we didn't really do a good job of it, so we stopped. And then we actually started it for real at the end of like the end of 2014. And then we did it for about three or four months and we put it on iTunes. And then these two guys who are now my bosses, uh, Alex Bloomberg and Matt Lieber, they reached out to me and Eric like, hey, we listen to your podcast. We liked it. Do you guys want to meet us? And we were like, yeah, obviously, like anything that will help me get out of this terrible job. And so <laughs> then we met them. And then a few months after that, um, I worked on a pilot for a show that ended up being Sampler. And then a few months after that, I started working at Gimlin as a host. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I talked to my mom this weekend because of Easter. And she reminded me of this. I was supposed to be a priest. Yeah. Uh, but they thought I was going to, I wanted to be John Travolta when I was growing up. Not, not an actor. I was like, I just want to be John Travolta. <laughs> and they wanted me to be a priest. And none of it worked out. But I, I eventually went to film and television. Um, I was a radio listener, but it really wasn't on my radar. And I started, I moved to New York after college and started working at Sesame Street, which was rad. It was a great place to get started. Um, and that moved into nonfiction narrative. Uh, and I went, I took a pause after a few years and there was kind of the priest thing that came into my life where it's like, be a social worker. Uh, Cause I wanted to make a lot of money. So I, I stopped, uh, I took a break from film and television. I, I moved, uh, DC is my hometown. Um, I was in South America, I moved back to DC and I was a case manager and social worker for a while and then started doing short form documentary pieces for USAID and then um, other organizations, things on my own. And John Volt is gonna loop back into this in a second because two things happened. Um, of course, the boom of audio content, I just, I really liked the, the intimacy of the medium as a listener. I was just gravitating, I was consuming more audio than film. And uh, a few years ago, I had to do this shoot and I didn't have a crew. And it was a docu. It was just like a, just a short form documentary piece with. Uh, it was it was a couple, and the husband was super skeptical. He w did not want to talk on camera. Um, and I just bought an H4N Zoom. Didn't know how to use it. I'm, I I wasn't an audio guy, but I was like, screw it. I got nobody else here. I'm just gonna set up the camera and then use the Zoom. And we I eventually didn't even use the camera because he got so comfortable talking in front of the mic. Um, and. I think there was some inherent trust that was there. I don't know what I did right, but I was like, this is something. Um, and at the same time, I rewatched Blowout with John Travolta. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's seen it. It's a great Brian De Palma movie. It's rad, but he's a sound guy. And the whole movie is about sound. And I was like, I need to look into this. Um, I, to, and to loop everything in, I work at a place in downtown Brooklyn called Brick. Uh, I was doing, I was running media education there for a while, and about a year ago or so, I made a pitch. I was like, we should focus on podcasting uh, for, you know, for our community, because we mostly focus on film and television. They're like, yeah, do that. I was like, all right, I'm here to learn how to do that. <laughs> so that's been the last year. All right. Yeah. Um, I, like, uh, uh like Brittany, I got a film school degree. I went to USC, and then I never, and then I ended up in entertainment journalism for a long time. So like I did the whole like, first I was like writing about rappers, 
for like a long time and then I did more like pop culture stuff and like writing I was like writing at EW and places like that and, and I I got tired of it and um, I quit and I made a movie and someone at I got recommended to This American Life so I was doing some consulting and then I started listening to This American Life because I had never heard it before. I started working there, <laughs> and then uh, and then I got a, a job. That was it. Like, I think that's that's <laughs> really? the way to sum it up. This is great. Like you totally like just skipped over the whole thing about making a movie. Um, yeah, if it's like if you can if you have if you can like figure out how to get money, you can make a movie. Like, the, like everyone is like, how do you make a movie? You just if you can get money, you can make a movie. It doesn't have to be a good movie, but it just has to like you just I got a little bit of money and I made a movie. That's it. <laughs> Shameless <plug>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the film is called Big Words. It used to be on Netflix up until January. I think they kicked this out when Obama left because the movie is vaguely about Obama. It's not about Obama at all, but it references him. <laughs> I think that's, that's it. It's, uh, it's, you can still find it on iTunes, and it's got a couple of television actors in it. And it's probably the thing I'm the most happiest I've ever done, but I try to undersell it because I don't know how to talk about it. So. <laughs> but you should see it. It's great. Right. Well, he totally <laughs> undersold it because I think I had to like dig and find that, and I was like, "But this name sounds really familiar because Image Nation. I did some work for Image Nation. Oh, okay. And we the oh, so, cool. Yeah, so yeah. Like, this guy sounds really familiar. Okay, so there we go. And, and I did have to dig for that. All right. So now we're going on to our next question. <laughs> Well, you do that. I'm curious. How many people listen to podcasts here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. All right. I was nervous. I was like, 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 Oh, man, that's cool. Well, great. And that's what I wanted. I really wanted people who already are kind of familiar with the medium and so we can have, like, really high-level conversation. It's not like podcasting, like, what it is, right? So moving on. Um. I know I have what what do you ask a question I just anytime I'm in a room like this I'm like what are you listening to yeah. <laughs> okay. but it's uh, probably too many people to call. Uh, well, well Torsi and we yeah. can go um, let's see okay now ooh, we're going straight in okay Carrie particularly Carrie and Brittany you know what does it take to like actually create mount a show um, a podcast or a yes. radio show? Yes. Um, a good idea. I okay. mean, that is like the absolute best thing. And to know what not to use, I would say, would be the, the second most important thing. Um, so if you're talking about like, I mean, first, if you, the first thing you have to do is create something that you can shop around. Even if it's a, a one pilot, it's probably better to do two or three. Um, but... Uh, you know that you have to be you have to have a good idea because there's so much out there that you you can't just you know you can't do you can't you don't want to fail out of the gate is that is that too depressing i don't know what do you think <laughs> um, <laughs> is it you that no, you're advanced I, when you think about this no well, i just i think that um there's right now it's the it, it, the it's saturated, right? So you you want to you want to do something, shop around to all of your smart friends, get up, you know, your people to listen to it. Uh, well, no, it um, I, um, well, I would say like you should actually do the thing. Like I, I meet people all the time who are like, man, I've been trying to start this podcast for like the past five years, <laughs> and I'm like, you could have run a marathon in the past five years. You could have started a family you could have gone to europe i don't know but like just actually do the thing like make something if you make something and it's bad or if you don't like it you can just like act like it never happened you can make it something else but like just get over the hump of like actually making something and then sharing it with other people because that can be like the hardest part and like speaking of what you're saying carrie like when eric and i started for colored nerds i personally there was like a whole thing we're sitting in his house and like he was like, so we should like we we had recorded three episodes, 
which is also another thing. If you want to get feedback from anybody, like make, make more than one like edition or more than one version of it. And uh, we made three episodes. We had them on SoundCloud. Like we kind of edited them a little bit and we were going to send them out to like, you know, 60 or 75 of our like friends, family, colleagues, anybody we thought might be interested along with a survey. It's so funny because we went into this being like, oh, we don't want to make any money, but we like took it really seriously always. So we sent out with a survey and then um, like gave people like a certain amount of time to get back to us. And we asked them like, what was their favorite part? What was their least favorite part? Where did they get bored? Where did they get lost? Mm -hmm. uh, we found out through sending out the survey that we never actually said our names or the title of the show <laughs> in the actual, like we would just start talking like, oh, hey, what's up? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but yeah, you can get a lot of valuable feedback and also like, um, yeah, you just get, like, you have to get over, like, the thing that I always say is people are like, I don't I want to start a podcast. What do you do? I'm like, well, just, like, like, remember before Beyonce put out Lemonade and everyone was like, what is her next album going to be? Like, what is she going to do next? How is she going to top herself? Nobody is thinking that about you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody is thinking that about you. You don't have these pressures. So just, like, make something and put it out and, like, don't, like belabor that too much just like you're the longer time that you spend thinking about whether or not like people are gonna like it is it gonna be good like it just keeps you from getting the reps in that you need to actually get better because even when you do learn to do one thing really well there's like a whole next level that you don't even have access to yet and then when you mm -hmm. finally get to the next level you're gonna suck again mm -hmm. so it's just like it's like a, a never-ending cycle where you get to start being bad at something all over again <laughs> and also speaking to your point about having a good idea I always say like have like a something that's really unique so it's like, if it's like, nobody can be you. Mm -hmm. So like, just do like, talk about what you want to talk about. If you're like going to sit down with your friend and record something and you're not interested in it, don't talk about it. Or talk about why you're not interested in it. But just like, nobody can be you. So like the, the best thing that you can do is come up with something that is compelling, like interesting to you. Yes. Not boring. And something that only you can do because like, that's, that's all any of us have in this world that's it Shruti did you want to add anything to it because you seem like oh no I okay. had a I had a, a question but I'm go ahead I, I, I'm, I'm so like it is a just always more interested in uh, being an interviewer than like talking I'm like but um yeah I think it was for Carrie and I don't remember what it was now go ahead it was <laughs> I mean so when you come into it you're like does somebody have an idea and you're helping them make the thing like material most of the so most of the projects that i've been on it, it's sort of at the startup stage mm -hmm. so um it's been a lot of like idea generation mm -hmm. and you have to think like you're going to be spending a lot of time on at least the su the topic area or the subjects so you gotta love it because it, especially when you're editing audio it's like you're you're back in those <laughs> you're in it for a long time hearing it over and over and over again and your ears will start bleeding and your soul will crush if you don't, <laughs> you don't love what you're doing. It's um, so yes, I think uh, I think having a, a, an idea that you really care about is is super important, and that also, you know, kind of is communicated through audio. If if you're if you don't like it, it you can't hide in audio. We were just talking about this. It's um, you you can you can really hear. Um, when something's not authentic. Mm -hmm. So that's why radio drama is so hard to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark, did you want to add something um, considering that you help people create podcasts? Do you actually help people create podcasts? Yeah, I before I came here, I was putting something up on SoundCloud. Um, so to give everybody some context, uh, Brick is an arts organization in downtown Brooklyn. We've been around for about 30 years, and our media background is primarily television. So we're the Public Access Center for Brooklyn. Um, and by the way, this isn't like a, a pitch, but you guys can come down. Um, not all at once, but I, honestly, as you should know that it's open to the public, but if anybody has any questions or is interested in what we talk about today regarding podcasts there, uh, just let me know. But we, we started this initiative, it just launched. But it was pitched about a year ago to create a public access model for podcasting uh, that wasn't just going to be Brooklyn based, but primarily service uh, the communities of Brooklyn. So I'm my job is. 
I mean, it's any nonprofit. I mean, anybody who works in a nonprofit, you're doing 50 things at once, no matter what your position is. Um, but I've become sort of a distributor and a programmer and a producer all at once. The thing is, I don't have editorial. I can offer editorial advice to people, but because it's a public access model, at least currently, people come in, they say, I want to do a show about fire engines in Queens. For some reason, that's the show they want to do. I'm, I'm not, I don't have any, we're not going to sell it. They, we just have to distribute. So it's like, great. Just, you need to, once you set an air date, you turn it in. So before I was coming in here, the main thing is just giving people the confidence. And, and just what you're saying was really, I, it's can't echo it enough. There's a woman that I was putting stuff of hers on sound. She's an octogenarian who just got an email account and made four podcast episodes. So I'm like, mic drop. Like, anybody should be doing, like, everybody can be doing podcasts. And, you know, I, that's amazing. It's incredible. And um, it speaks a lot to the medium, but... Yeah, we're basically, I, I act as sort of, I continue the social worker roots where it's, you know, listening and encouragement, like, just keep doing it. Um, yeah, there's more I can say, but that's where we're at right now with that. Okay. So what does it mean to be a producer and a showrunner, particularly in podcasting? Or, uh, or is being a reporter any different than them print online or, or broadcast? So as, some, as someone who came from TV, I think the words producer and reporter, what they mean in TV, just throw that out the window. In okay. radio, it's really like, and, and it depends on show, like on, on, on different shows. So at NPR, there's a pretty strict line between reporters and producers. Like the reporter actually reports the story. They like do all the interviews and the producer only puts it together. Like they take the audio snippets and build the thing. Um, at This American Life, at Gimlet, producers are reporters. Like there's no lines. Uh, and so I will produce other people. So we have, uh, you know, two hosts that work on my show. Uh, plus a few other producers. I'll produce the hosts. I'll produce the other producers. Um, if I'm reporting something, I can choose to work alone uh, because I'm a control freak. Or like I can say, hey, can you help me produce this? Like, and that means they'll sit in my interview. They'll listen in while I'm talking to somebody in a studio. They'll, you know, we use Slack, and so they'll like Slack questions, like, hey, ask them this. Um, you know, just sort of a second ear because they're really listening to it almost the way the radio listener would listen to it. Um, they can help actually take all that audio um, as a producer and cut it up, find the best parts, and then help you while you're building the story, um, you know, be kind of an editor before you take it to an edit stage. So yeah, producers are like your, your, your sous chefs. It's fun. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's very fluid depending um, on the project. Uh, and the other people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, right now, my title is senior producer, but I work with producers, and primarily what I'm doing is editing their, uh, you know, editing their tape. But it's essentially, a, you know, it's like a script edit. So, um, yeah, uh, it's it's super fluid. What about you guys? <laughs> yeah, uh, the model is pretty similar to what Shruti said for for TAL. Um, it's very like it can be very soup to nuts, almost to like annoying degree. Like I also, you know, like I, I can, I, I, you know, we mix our own stuff. We find our own music. Like production is all the way from the beginning to the end. If you, if you start, if, if you start as the reporter, you're the reporter and the producer all the way through until you're at in edits where other people are sitting around contributing. But at the end of the day, like you might put the whole story together yourself, like really mix it and everything. I think the only thing I would say is like is to emphasize what it means to be a reporter or a contributor working with a producer. And the only reason I'm emphasizing this is because I, I came here primarily to find contributors. Like that was the whole nature. That's the post that you saw was the whole conversation was me trying to figure out how to find more people to work with. So I will explain then what, like a contributor, you just have a story and you come to us with a story and you have this idea for it and you can be at any stage of development. Like I, I did a story with a woman, she pitched it to me at a party we never met before. And um, 
she it was about her grandmother and she would go visit her grandmother she had some tapes so she had like she she was a filmmaker her name is Lulu Wang, Lulu Wang and she'd made a few movies and she always had always had a, car- a camera with her so when she would go visit her mother in China she would get footage so when she came to us she had a basic story and she had actual footage to play us so we helped her put the story into an into a shape she sat through edits but she had an idea of what she wanted to do i was the producer she's the reporter on the thing and it made it to radio and the the film uh then the story was optioned by chris rock white she went to sundance just with off the story she did for us and wow. we don't you know we don't have any rights to it it's her story she came to us with the baby like that's not always going to be the case depending on how much work we put into it but she came to us with this an idea and a good one and she had a little bit of tape which is why I've always been interested in like working with documentarians cuz they know how to get tape and they know how to get like they come to us with raw materials and then we just you know we can work with you on the thing all the way to the end so just to piggyback off of what you're saying that's so true and 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 the thing is that I, i mean i think as an outsider if you don't know how to make radio i think a good way to look at a producer is almost like as a translator like they're going to take your stuff like whatever you've gathered whatever you're going to gather like they'll come with you to interviews and just help you make sure that the stuff you're gathering will be a thing that can be turned into a radio story and they'll just help they'll just support you as you record it so it's a nice crutch to know that it exists so it's not something to be like entirely afraid of if you've never done radio cuz like i haven't I had never done radio. Like I, you know, I I know what editing software looks like from film and from like making beats, but I didn't like I never done radio. But there are people who are good enough at it to get me through it. It's a one-hour show, but like it depends. Okay. She wants to know what's the timeline, the, the, the timeline for making something. I mean, um, it depends. Like I've seen shows, like we did the Greek, the Greece rep, refugee show was like six months of preparation. I mean, Shit Town is three years. Like it depends. It's like we don't have a, you know, it depends on what the story takes to make. Okay. Yeah. And this twenty minutes, sixty minutes. I mean, is that the show? Or what should you be thinking about when you're looking to pitch? You're just talking about figuring out what show you think it will best work on, mm-hmm. and then pitching to them based on what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? I mean, you should definitely like listen to a lot of the show you want to pitch to, <laughs> like and yeah. see what's worked. Well, you are only going to hear what works. Like right. when I when I got when I got this job. Someone said to me, "We kill fifty percent of the things that are pitched." I think it's higher than that. I think it's way higher than that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I mean, there's that a lot that are of in that are accept, accepted pitches yeah. in production. It's fifty percent. No, I, it, like stuff that's pitched is fifty percent. Like, well, some of the pitches way more. Than, no, no, that's like way. No, no, it's more. Yeah, than, it's yeah, like yeah, no, it's like. Yeah, I think, yeah. It's, yeah, it's more like stuff that gets like past the pitch stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, the thing is, you don't have to have everything figured out, though. If you mm. listen to a show and you love it, and you're like, "Wow, this thing that I'm working on, I can picture it on this." All you need to say, like, send an email to the show and say, "I have a story." You know, once upon a time, whatever. Like, just tell the a brief version of the story, and if they're interested, maybe you send tape. I'm if it's pitch to reply all, you don't need to send anything. Just tell the story as you would to a friend. You know, just write it out, and then、um, if they get back to you, then you can figure out the next step. Like send them tape; they'll help you figure out how many is this twenty minutes? Is this an hour? Is this multiple episodes? Like this is all stuff that you don't need to know in order to pitch. There should be like some evidence of. I don't know how you guys get pitches. We have like an email address that you can send pitches to. There should be some evidence of storytelling ability in the pitch. Like you have to frame it in some way that is appealing, even if you don't have、yeah. the thing. Like there's just got to be some evidence that you can tell a story or that you know that what a story is. Like, I mean, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I don't want to be a dick about this, but like a lot of people like a story. Like we、we'll、pitch a story, be like, I know this person, and like a person is not a story.、Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a story is a like there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Just think about that. Like, if you pitch something and it doesn't have, you don't have any idea what the middle or the end is. Don't pitch it. It's like not there yet. 
Carrie, you set to the end of your seat there. Oh, I'm just I, like, I'm thinking brevity is always nice. Um, if you have a source that's a great character, um, definitely include the source. Um, yeah, always, I think you're exactly right. Uh, if, if a pitch doesn't have to have everything in it, but it has to have enough to get me curious and pick up mm -hmm. the phone yeah. or, or, you know, hit reply. Uh, I think most shows out there are desperate for good material mm -hmm. and fresh ideas. Mm -hmm. And we're all overworked and would absolutely love, you know, I think there's there's two things and, and maybe um, I don't know I, if you have a a sort of let's call it an hour long like a solid idea beautiful arc you have it what if they were just 15 minutes? 15 minutes but this is what I'm saying you could do a series you could do the first you know you you know where the chapters are you can just cut and get people to you know to download the next one um, so, you know, that's one way. The other is you can look at it a little bit like, um, you know, a, a long form piece in the New Yorker that then gets picked up, the rights get picked up for a movie or, you know, for something else. So it's, you can, that's a little bit more like a, um, you know, a, a condensed version of the full story. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to pitch a show, they're going to want a story. But it sounds like you might have a, something that you're considering as its own standalone series, yeah? So you might want to take that idea to one of the networks that are that are kind of up and running now. Jim Lit. <laughs> right. Um, so I have a, so to piggyback on that, like I also have a question in terms of, um, <clears throat> you know, like serial and like all these series and the same thing with like, I'm, you know, in the documentary world. So if you have um, a film that you're interested in, how many episodes is that? And then what is the length, you know, how many episodes do you need to have? Is it like, you know, like Netflix is 13, you know? <laughs> uh, you know oh, is that true? Well, yeah, yeah? Gen okay. generally. Um, you know, so... Like, is it 13 episodes or or it's just whatever the story can bear? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It could be a series of two. Yeah. Okay. It's whatever it needs to be. Okay. And, I mean, I, I love series. I listen to them all the time. Nine out of ten times, I feel like this should have been one. Like, it, you know, I feel like the mistake a lot of people are making, a lot of us are making, it's like trying... You Okay, here's a good example. The people who made The Jinx, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Um, mm -hmm. So they work at Gimlet right now. They produce a podcast called Crime Town. And they, a thing that they told me, which I just found fascinating, is for years, for seven years, they tried to make The Jinx into a movie, like one feature-length film. And they would keep doing edits, and they would keep being like, oh, something's just not right. Like, we know the story's great but we're just not able to get it right. Like it's too much background, too little background. And then they said, you know what, instead of making it a feature, why don't we just try making a pilot? 
like we don't know how many episodes there's going to be, but it'll be a, a pilot that sets up the story. And they did that, and they were like, we knew. We knew this was it. And so then they started sketching out, like, what are the next episodes? Like, wh how do we, like, what's the shortest way to tell the most compelling story? So I think it's easier in podcasting because you don't have a number you're trying to hit. It's really whatever mm. the story wants to be. Okay. Okay. All right. Any? Oh, this guy's been a question for a while. Talk about story. When you say talk show, would it be like you talking to someone that you are like friends with, or would it be you and like a guest? I've, I've, I've guest co hosted on my friend's podcast, and we, we talk about we talk about culture and stuff like that. And we just we pick a topic, we pick a show, we pick a movie, and we talk about it. And, and, and our, you know, our uh, take on that show. So like a conversational podcast is a little easier to throw together than maybe something where you have to like say report and like turn it into a story. So like, and uh, what I, I mean, I don't know, it sounds like you guys already have something. That's when like, I would just immediately take the thing that you already have. But maybe if you feel like you're, maybe you're not proud of that stuff anymore, like you guys could do something a little bit yeah, more advanced or better. Off. What's that? Oh, you're going to break off and you're going to do your own thing. <laughs> That's right. So, okay. So, yeah, then just, like, make, make like, like, three, like, three things, like, three, to like, episodes or whatever of the thing that you're going to make, your solo project, and, um, like, try to get feedback on that stuff as soon as possible. Because the thing about, like, conversational podcasts, like, one way in which, like, um, narrative podcasts and conversational podcasts are similar is that people always need to be reminded of what you're talking about and they always need context. Um, so like that means like if you're, let's say, you know, it's going to be you every week talking to like someone who made a particular movie. People are going to want to hear movie clips. Uh, people are going to want to, you know, they're going to want a rundown of what the movie is about. They're going to want to know that, you know, the names of the actors that play the lead characters. People need context the same way like, uh, like Neil just worked on Shit Town which is an amazing podcast and like the story is so winding and like it goes so many different places but they're always like because it's audio they always need to give you facts the same facts over and over again because if you're reading something you can just scroll back up and be like right, right. oh right right, right, right. I remember that. right but in audio you're like who is this what is this happening but like so they just you just constantly need to be giving people context and also like if you get bored like the listener gets bored it's like it's bad don't want that and like when you're talking and it's you, and you've said something that is boring, doesn't make any sense, isn't going anywhere, it's whack. You just gotta cut it out, you gotta let it go. It's gonna happen over and over and over again. But just like um, like keeping things interesting, like there, I don't know what conversational podcasts you listen to, but chances are like the ones that you like, people have a certain rhythm back and forth, you know what I mean? Like they have a good rapport, and there's like some sort of pacing to the conversation. So like just listening to stuff that you like and trying to fashion the conversations that you have to be closer to the stuff that you like. Like even if you don't necessarily hit, you know, the, like even if you're not as happy with what you've made as what, you know, someone that you admire is doing, you can just keep doing it and get closer and closer and better and better. You said that, it's easier to pitch that. Well, it's not necessarily easier to pitch that. It's easier, it's easier to produce. To it's easier to make and it's easier to produce the first few episodes. So it's like easier to get like it's easier to group those things to like get something together and then like get feedback. And all, I would always say get feedback from people that you know before you go pitching anybody anything. I don't know if you do you listen. Brittany and Eric have a great podcast. Yes, um, they do. that everybody. I'm just gonna plug it. Everybody should listen to. <laughs> it's really good, but it's a good model as well. From what it sounded like from the first mm -hmm. episode was like you guys just. We have a general idea. We're just gonna run and gun mm -hmm. and do it and what you're two years a year and a half two yeah, years into it for like two and a half years now 
which is like in podcasting, that's three centuries. <laughs> that's a long time. I think the benefit, especially with sort of the model that looking at even the development of your show is the benefit to something like that, where you're not necessarily pitching an idea, you know, like I want to, I'm going to do this story. It's going to be 20 minutes. You're not pitching necessarily a, a philosophy is it's to, it's, my guess is like the audience engagement is really, it's, it's at a different level with a interview based show where you really create, you know, the audience can sort of expect the personalities behind something a lot more. So like, for instance, with your show, even if you, even if you sort of, I like get a preview of what the content will be, I'm like, I can guess how Brittany is going to react to this. I can sort of like, I have enough of a context and I'm really excited to see her take on whether it's a current event, something that happened in the last week, or geeking out on something. And that's a real benefit to developing an interview-based show, is, is sort of finding that for yourself. I think also geeking out on your own, like, oh my God, this is how I feel. It's really developing a point of view. Um, that's my take on it. I think that's the real, the real uh, push for doing something like that. Well, while, while we're there, like, what actually are the different genres in podcasting? Oh, everything. <laughs> Uh-oh. Whatever it is yeah. you want to talk about, there's like, there's there are things that are like, like narrative even is like a big umbrella because okay. you can have like, we'll tie all the narrative podcasts and you guys report a different story, crazy story about the internet every week. But also like, I know with like, story core, like you guys do something completely different, but it's still like a story and shit town is like a story. And then also, like, there's this Canadian show that I'm obsessed with called Sleepover, mm. where, like, this woman invites three people from all over Canada, different racial backgrounds, age, like, ages from different parts of the country. Canada is very big. And she has them all sleep over in a hotel room, like, for a night. And they, like, all come and help each other solve a problem that they're having in their wow. life. And what? it's experiential. Yeah. So it's, like, it's narrative. Like, there's a story, there's an arc to them staying in this hotel overnight. Mm -hmm. But it's also, like... You feel like you're there, like with them. Like I mean, yeah. people listen. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, so, so basically, <laughs> it's like narr narrative, um, where people are telling a story, whether it be fictional or nonfiction, and then kind of the the hosted show where people are interviewing someone or talking with another person or persons. Yes? Yeah. Are there are there other things? I mean it's it's basically that, but it doesn't like it doesn't help you at all to think that way really. You okay. know what I mean? Like it's like do what the fuck you want. Like yeah. honestly that's the great thing about it in some ways is that you can sort of imagine different possibilities, yeah. you know? Like Okay. I like I'm like when I think of like a like I don't it's interesting to think of, I like how would you classify reply reply all? Oh I, I I mean, it depends on how much time a person has. Yeah, yeah. Or what episode you're listening to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we say we're a show about the internet, but we have no format whatsoever. We've done... It's, it's, but it's, it's completely based on the host. It's Ex a talent. It's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's, it's personality. Yeah. Based. yeah. 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 Okay. It's so huge. Yeah, I think the thing yeah. to think about, like, is, I don't know, is intimacy comes up a lot mm -hmm. with, like, radio because you're, like, literally speaking directly yeah. into someone's ear. So just trying to, like, imagine something that direct yeah mm. and i don't know if that's that's not a that's not a specification about format that's just like mm. the the sort of advantages of the form it needs to be you, you need to be authentic with yeah. yourself and with the the listener i think mm. it's good to imagine a listener of one mm -hmm. whereas in radio we we like to think like you know some intimacy but you know probably at a maybe four foot distance you yeah know. um so, I mean, that's to me the main difference. Uh, I think, obviously, documentary, um, you're, you're relying, uh, for audio, you're, you still need the same scenes that you need to shoot, but you have to walk us through them. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to hear it. We have to hear you go into a different space mm -hmm. um, somehow. To me, it's as varied as the world of documentary, like yeah. film. You know what I mean? Like if somebody, there's the broad, the most broad categorizations are like, uh, you know, nonfiction and fiction. But within those, and and sadly in document in podcasting, we don't have much within fiction. But within nonfiction, I feel like people are thinking more about what kind of experience do they want to create, and not so much about like what specific format am I trying to fill, like. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, the podcast I can't stop thinking about or talking about is Shit Town, which is the one that Neil just helped edit. And the, the beauty of it is like, it breaks all conventions, you know, like you think that there are rules and what seems to have been the leading thought there is like, how do we want people to feel at every moment? You know, and it's really, it gives you a very different pacing, a very different style. So. Can you speak up a little bit? I can someone make money in the podcast industry. Oh. I'm so surprised that question took so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can ask Lieber. I mean, uh, he's probably the, um, the uh, uh, well, Matt Lieber is actually used to um, work on one of the shows that I've developed called Fair Game. So he was a senior producer there and he um, uh, created Gimlet with, I think, a really ambitious model, you know, to, um, it's, if you have to have a large audience, a reasonably large audience, so then you can get some advertising revenue. Um, What's and, the large audience? One million, two million? Not quite that much. Well, okay, it depends. It's like, do you want to have, like, money to go to a baseball game, or do you want to live your whole life? Okay. So it's like, do you want a yearly salary or do you want like to make some extra money from a side project? And I feel like you could, I feel like in podcasting, I feel like it's almost like one or the other. And I do both. And I can tell you that the podcast I do on the side does not have a million listeners. It doesn't have half a million listeners. It, I don't even make, I'm not even sure if we have 10%. I don't even know. But um, it, we make like some money. We make a, a little bit of money. Um, and but like that i think that how i put it i think if i had gone into it attempting to make money yeah i would have been heartbroken broke and yeah. sorely disappointed it just seems like if you want to if you want to make money you should just do something else like but no seriously i, I say that about most creative ventures it's like look you 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 got a suit on like it seems like you could do like you know account like you could do something like it's not what it's it's not gonna yeah, be that no. like most likely. Yeah. I mean, okay, but it's not impossible. <laughs> it's not impossible. But what you, I think the, the end game for a, a, a person with a, with a podcasting idea is to, uh, you know, obviously have a good idea, create something great, and shop it to one of these great networks that have sprung up. And they sort of act as gatekeepers. And um, they, it's like, if you like one Radiotopia show, you're probably going to listen. They, they cross promote. They do group ad buys um, so they can share revenue across programming. You know, I mean, that's that's kind of what you want to do. Uh, and another thing, I think most of the, so at least one of the podcasts that I uh, worked on called The Truth, we had a piece on This American Life. And all of a sudden we were number one in iTunes. I had a you know, million listeners and it would just kind of like happen like that. So mm -hmm. you... You want to, um, before you get on to get with a network, you might even talk to one of these public radio shows that have a large audience and say, hey, I've got a piece. So you get your, uh, you know, a thing, and then you shop it to a national show and see if you can get some traction that way. I think but, the thing to remember, though, is like, I, I mean, that Britney didn't approach a network like she was found, right? If, mm -hmm. I mean, which, was yeah. it fair to say that? I feel like there's a lot of people in podcasting, now, whether it's, yeah. yeah, who are actively looking for people who are interesting, who have like access to like a totally different audience or doing something weird. And I mean, there's, there's, you know, if you enjoy what you're doing and it's clear and people, even if like, I don't know, how many people were listening to For Colored Nerds when... When they reached out to us? Yeah. I don't know, 219? Exactly. <laughs> Two, like, some, it's just... But they were, but they were a, you know, a startup network, and they were, like, you know, yeah, we were like scrappy. The, the and first people like, they, they were They out. were digging because they were going to find good... They knew. Yeah. It's all talent. You have, to, you have to have great hosts to have a good podcast. Yeah. So, and they, they recognize that, and they put the hours in. And there's a lot of... Well, it's hard work. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I mean, the, the like, uh, on, okay, it's so, like I'm making this podcast for two and a half years. I made this podcast, like, while I started a new full-time job, while my podcasting partner changed full-time jobs, like, three times. <laughs> His wife had a baby. 
they move. Like, it was just like, I mean, the amount of money that I made from this podcast is not anywhere near the amount of time that I spent working on it. Like, I miss, like, people's birthdays, like, parts of holidays, most of my weekends. <laughs> like, just trying to make this podcast that at one point, I don't know, like, 19 people were listening to it and we were really hyped about that. <laughs> so, like, the, like, there are opportunities, there are ways to make money doing it, but, like, you like, don't try to get rich. Like, if you like money... Like what Neil said, like podcasting is not the thing to go for. Uh, but like, if you really enjoy it and like you um, and you want to see something through, and like you are interested in like figuring out growth hacks for your audience, and like you know, looking for um, there are companies that do like work. Like there are companies that will um, find average. If you have if you have an audience of a certain size. It, it's not even, I don't even think you need, I think you need to get like 40,000 downloads a month or something like that. Um, which like, it sounds like a lot, but like it's doable. And it's not, and that doesn't mean any, anywhere near like even, you know, 50,000 listeners. Like you don't need 50,000 listeners to get 40,000 dollars a month. Um, but if you have anything like in that range, like you can, you can talk to an advertising company, like a company that does podcast advertising and they'll find advertisers and try to hook you up with them. Again, it's a slow trickle. But if like if that's a goal for you, then there's ways to do it. I just wouldn't like look toward that as like a way to make yeah. a lot of revenue. There is one other way though, which mm -hmm. is find a show you love and apply for a job. Yes, like there are jobs in this industry. You know, yeah. there are people. That there's hundreds, dare I say, thousands of producers. Like not just at podcasting companies, but also at great radio networks. Mm -hmm. so. What I was going to yeah. say. What about yeah. branding? So. Branded branding content. Branded content. So it sounds like a podcast, but it's sponsored by somebody. Do you want to make branded podcast? We have a different arm of the company, <laughs> a totally separate company. I have to say over and over again. But like, uh, the, the, but like you know, so we work with like major brands, and we'll make like podcasts for them. Um, but also, like, there are lots of companies that do. There are companies that are starting to make their own branded content, like in house. So uh, even I think about like. And also, too, those are actually pretty good opportunities, especially to get your feet wet. Um, because a lot of the time, like, major co some major companies don't have the money or they don't want to invest the money to, like, hire a whole team or, and, like, you know, do all this stuff and try to hire a celebrity host or whatever. They want to make content with people that they have in-house with the money that they have. So they will be like, I mean, it's a lot of work, but they'll hire one person. It could be you. And you'll be making, like, eight shows that are, you know what I'm saying? You'll be making, like, eight shows a week. Um, but like I know people who have done that or are doing that and are, and are getting a ton of really great technical experience and are learning on the job. They're going to be because you're making a podcast for them at a price that's probably cheaper than like them working with like an advertising company or with a company that like you know like a Gimlet Creative or a Pineapple Studios. Like because they're working with one of you instead of like a whole team of those people, they're going to be like, okay, can you just make this thing? Can you just like, try to make it work? They'll be a little more open to you, like learning things on the job, and that is a way to get your foot in the door, also. Like I know a guy who just got approached. He's just like a NPR guy. He got approached to do um, a podcast about a very like a popular platinum rapper. Like they just they, his company, the, the guy, the artist, they wanted a podcast about him, so they just were looking for people, and they found a guy who does a podcast where he talks about music on NPR, and they they were like this is the budget. Can you put it together? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an opportunity. Although, also, can I just say, like, if anybody, is anybody here, like, not listen to startup? Because we're, like, talking about podcasts. There's, like, a master class in yeah, podcasting right. yeah, on the, point. like, you can listen to that and know most of the things that we just said. So, if you have, like, if you haven't listened to startup, it's, like, the best thing, the best way to, like, learn about how the business works. Yes. 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 Okay. So one of the things that has been talked about over and over and over is authenticity. So, and, and I guess also finding your own voice. How, this seems like a 101 kind of question, but like how is that created? Because, you know, um, one of the things that sometimes is, is, is apparent is even in, so, okay, you know, I'm do documentary. Okay, can't help it. Can't, you know, but um, in terms of hearing so 
someone's voice because even if you're not talking, your voice is there and looking at how to be really authentic about that because we're talking about there's no there's no filter. There's no um, images to distract you. It's just you and sound, right? So then how is that? Is it created or is it just something that you have to just decide that you're going to do? I think you just keep scratching an itch. But I also think that's just anything creative, um, whether it's going back to like a a talk format or whether you're pitching a story or whether you're like, I don't know if this documentary project would work better as an audio project or it should be six epi episodes or whatever it is. I think it's just eternally, maybe eternally isn't the right word, but just keep scratching whatever that interest is to define and chisel away what your point of view is. And that can be over 10 episodes of you and your buddy talking about what are what are you doing a nerd culture podcast? That's what that's what you're into. So whether it's like sci-fi or whether it's like ten episodes in, you're like, oh my god! All we're going to talk about is episode three of Battlestar Galactica. Like that's really what our point of view is, and that's great if you can define it, if you can chisel it down that that way, or if you're creating a, a a story that you're trying to pitch somewhere. But I think it's really I. When we've been talking to people that are coming in to Brick and sort of maybe even for the first time developing content, it really is what interests you. But I tell people, it's like, what's that point when you're talking to your friend and you just get a smirk? Like, even if it's a, even if it's a, uh, it doesn't have to be a funny story, but that moment you're like, ah, oh, this is the interesting part. And maybe something that you would quietly say to friends. So, uh, I think with anything, in whatever format it is, that's just, that's always been, that's that's what we're telling people that are coming in lately and producing content for the first time is to just take that itch and just run with it. Okay. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Um, <laughs> the next thing is, I, I got you, but uh, editing. That was, that's something that people talk about over and over <laughs> I'm looking at Brittany's face, something that like is hammered down. So please talk to us about that. Is that just, you know, slicing ums out or like really like slice and dice? You got to leave those in. That's oh. authenticity. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I this is one of the things that I kind of love the most, uh, how to sort of cut something down um, and, and have it still feel like the person is coming to that, you know, conclusion or that idea in the moment. Um, I think the, the, the sort of way that I edit is, um, and I guess you use some of the same terms, but I mean, my selects are, I will record too much always. Uh, and then I will, uh, you know, put it on in the background and go and do the dishes or go and, you know, fart around and whenever my attention goes back to the tape, I make a note of it. I pull, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, that's kind of the main thing. So I go through, I listen and I, I pull my selects and then I listen again and I see if they still surprise me. If they surprise me a couple of times, then I d d decide which ones kind of tell a story. So I don't, I, I usually set out to have a, uh, you know, I, I kind of have an agenda when I go out, but I am actively allowing myself to get knocked off point and, and go after what's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and again, that goes back to authenticity. It's like that, you know, somebody's, if they said something a hundred times, it's not going to sound great. But if you get them to kind of then go a bit further or go in another direction and they're thinking and, and sort of putting the idea together in the mm -hmm. moment, then mm -hmm. um, that it just, it, it does something. You can mm -hmm. hear it. Mm -hmm. You can hear it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you've cut all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, I feel like so far on the like upward slope of the learning curve here because I just, you know, I just sort of came to this type of editing and I, I find it constantly challenging. But it's funny that what you just said, like literally, I was having a conversation, I was, I'm planning to go do an interview in Detroit on Friday and I was just talking to Nancy Updike, who's like an incredible, incredible editor and like, tape gatherer and she was saying she said exactly what you said which is like if you can find somebody if you're talking to someone and you can find someone coming to an idea in the moment that it's happening like that 
like like literally you ca can capture someone thinking something through that, that that's like the greatest tape um also like i come from a lot of print journalism and i and it's just such a different thing because like some somebody might say the right thing but it doesn't sound right so mm -hmm. it's like unusable that was like a big learning curve yeah. for me was like like I'd be looking at the log, yeah. It's like yeah, like like if you look at the log, it's like that's a great piece of tape, and then you like pull it and you play it, and you're like, oh, this doesn't work on the radio at all, you know? Like, and also, but there's like one thing I learned in print, and this is I always tell this is like the, my favorite thing that's ever happened to me. Like I was working at Entertainment Weekly, and I was at the Toronto Film Festival, and we were supposed to interview the head of Lionsgate, and I got an interview with a partner. It was a friend of mine, this woman Karen. And Karen was like a veteran writer at the newspaper, at, at the magazine, and I was like sort of still kind of newish at it. So we went, and I, I prepared all these questions, right? And so we're sitting at the, at the at sitting at outside with the head of Lionsgate. We only have like 15 minutes. And I asked him like, okay, so how many films did Lionsgate uh, produce this year versus acquire? I was trying to get this sort of like judgment of like how the company worked. And he answered my question, whatever. And then I swear to God, Karen looked at him and she said, when you wake up in the morning, do you hate yourself? It was like the most, I was like, what is that question? But the, whole, but the point of it was like, yes. the thing that I was asking him, you could research, exactly. you could ask exactly. his assistant, you know, but like that thing, that emotion that she was trying to go after, like that, that's, no one else would get that. So like the thing, the thing is to try to get, like if you are trying to gather tape, it's always like great to try to get something that is like, not something you can find out from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, the one thing I'll say is that <clears throat> an editor in radio, or at least the kind of radio that we do, is very different <laughs> than like, I think editors, the, the few editors that we've hired at Gimlet, especially when they come from print, are pretty shocked at like what it means to edit in, 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 in this field. So an editor is like your, your like, if you're left brain, they're right brain, right? They, um, you know, it starts when you have a story idea or if you have a conversation idea, like, oh, I want to talk to this person, right? The editor is, say, your friend or an editor editor who will say, like, well, what is the conversation about? Like, what do you want to know? Like, what's, what are the things that you, they, they sort of map out the, the arc of the thing that you want. And then, of course, you go do the conversation and it could go completely differently, right? And then you come back and your editor is a person who's like helping you sort through the thing and saying like, oh yeah, let's make a different map, right? And then you put the thing together and your editor is a person who's like listening with you and helping you take the whatever piece of crap that you have <laughs> and like polishing it slowly, slowly, slowly until in the end you hear a thing and you're like, wow, I didn't know, like I could do something that good. <laughs> you know, they're really, you can be very, um, you can get very dependent on them is a little problem. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's very, at least from my experience in terms of, of, of broadcasts, it's like they're the ones who do the magic because you have an idea of how it's going to be, then you go and you get, you know, do the interviews or, or shoot the footage, and then you have a whole other story, and then you get to the editing, um, to editing, and then now a whole other story gets created, which is sometimes... It, in the best possible worlds, with depending on how much money you have, is close to what you what you thought about, or if you have very little money, it's something completely different, but hopefully much better. So um, that's I mean, kind of what I'm hearing. I would say the way editing works in radio is the way it probably should ideally work in print. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times, print mm -hmm. editors don't spend enough time with you at the beginning. And so I think like I've kind of, I, like I'm a little bit like it's a little stressful working in radio because I feel like in a way I'm like stay out of my business for a little like for a little but it's like it's like incredibly helpful to have somebody who's actually willing to talk to you from the very beginning. Well, and then and after like what what's your what what moved you in the moment? What's your favorite tape? Like yeah. helping you mm -hmm. helping you mm -hmm. sort of articulate why you want to even talk to this person. Mm. to it, help you ask the right questions when you get there. I always describe it, this is probably terribly unhealthy, but I always <laughs> describe an editor as like a therapist. So like I have, um, kind of in between editors right now, but I have like an editor some of the time who you also work with, who's a great guy, Jorge. Oh, yeah. And so I meet with him like every other week for like an hour. And it's basically me just being like, this is everything that I'm working on right now. This is how I feel about all of it. My stress level is high. What is happening? And that person will be like, 
it's okay. they'll be like, okay, I heard what you're saying. 70% of it is anxiety and you need to chill. And then, but here's the other 30% and like, here's a way that we can kind of go about it. They sort of like, like, they like, they definitely hype you up to make you feel like you could, when you're like, oh, I don't think this is gonna work, I think this is trash. They'll be like, no, 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 there's some things here. And like, you know, even if like, like something that like my current editor always says is like, you know, it's sounding really good. Even if it's not true, <laughs> he's just like, it's sounding really good. And then he, I didn't realize that until he like gave a talk about it someplace else. Yes. <laughs> and he was like, this is the thing that I say. <laughs> but I know it works though. It's like having a person kind of be like, it's okay. You're gonna, this is gonna be a thing. And then like they give you some marching orders and like help you like figure out what to do next. And then just you found out I'm a it. terrible editor. <laughs> well, making a thing it puts you in a really vulnerable place and I think we don't talk enough about like the anxieties of putting your voice out there and like attached to a thing even if it's a talk show it's still a thing yeah. that you're like it's like standing naked in front of the world and I feel like your editor again this could be just a friend who's helping you with the show mm -hmm. is helping like kind of rub your back down <laughs> when you're in the corner yeah. and just be like go yeah, just, like yeah. right 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 you had your hand up for a while. Uh, two, two questions. <clears throat> One is related to preparation, uh, especially maybe for Brittany or anyone who uh, y'all work with on your host. Can you talk about, as they lead up to their show, how much time goes into actually getting prepared for those on air and And then the other part of the question is, uh, you guys talk about pitching ideas. I wanted to use like a real example. If I were to pitch the show to him, like who I call, what's in the package, um, what type of stats are looking for, like a real example, like you're there, you need to help me, maybe help them on the podcast, what would be, who do you contact, what do you get? Do we answer the first question? First question. Yeah, the first question. <laughs> how to prepare. So is this like how to prepare, like if you're, if you like for your host. Your a host, host right? to like just interview somebody? If you're a host of a on-air program where, let's say, Okay. Depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. Depends on how, on how, like, like, okay, so, like, there's, like, like, uh, um, I'm doing, like, Eric and I are doing this live thing on Saturday, and one of the people that we are talking to wrote a book, and I am reading this woman's book. It's a great book, but reading a book takes more time than, like, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't know, like a year ago, we had somebody on the show, this fantastic writer, Doreen St. Felix. She also hosted, well, hosted podcasts at MTV. She's really, really smart, amazing writer. But when we had her on, she had only, she's like a super compelling person, but she was a new writer. And so she'd only been, she only wrote like maybe fewer than 10 pieces. So to read like maybe eight essays takes less time. You know what I'm saying? Than to read an entire book or to like watch a few of someone's movies. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, but it, it, yeah, it depends on who you're talking to and for how long and what about. Like, you may have to watch other, like something I like to do is to watch or read other interviews that the person has done. Yeah. And then like not ask them stuff that they've been asked before or like read essays about um, something that I'm gonna talk about um, so that like I can either like learn about how other people feel about a thing um, and then so I can not talk about those things or or bring them in as a part of a conversation. Like something that Eric and I used to do when we felt that we had more time, um, which is an illusion. We um, would like make this thing called like the reading, which were like, we would maybe want to talk about a topic. Um, so like, let's say we wanted to talk about, we had this episode, we talked about the movie Boomerang, which is a, an Eddie Murphy movie from maybe like a year or something you guys were born. And, <laughs> And like, uh, so we like, read, you know, we watched the movie, we read different essays, we listened to the soundtrack, and then we would like put links to all of those things in like a, I don't know, I'm not very internet savvy, but in like a thing, and then <laughs> click it and they could see everything. Uh, but it just depends, it depends on who you're talking to, it depends on what you're talking about. And also too, preparation is in for everybody. I find that if I'm prepared, then like I can talk more from a place of knowledge. But sometimes on some real, like especially when you're making something that has to come out all the time, like, you don't have all week to prepare something. Sometimes you're like, okay, so well, the thing that we we're gonna make for the episode that's coming out next month, it's like Wednesday, and the thing that you need to come out next Monday is not gonna happen, and you need to come up with something new to do in the next 
48 to 72 hours. And so maybe then you then you don't have a week, you know what I'm saying? It's just, um, but maybe like, okay, so like, speaking as a person who um, has had a podcast on the side while having a full-time job, like, okay, having it in radio makes it a little bit easier because it's not like I'm constantly like going from like typing in spreadsheets and like doing people's expense reports to working on a podcast. Like, I can just sort of go like, oh, I'm working on this radio and now I'm working on this radio. But like when I had a full-time job in a different industry and then I was working on my podcast on the side, I just had to be real about like my time constraints. Like, you know, my co-host and I both have partners. He has a child. He has bills and stuff. Like, I'm trying to get my credit in a even better place than it already is. Like, I have stuff to do. Like, so, like for me, it's not necessarily realistic to spend, you know, tons of time preparing for something if I'm only going to sit down with somebody for 60 minutes. Um, so you just kind of have to figure out like like what's depends on who you're talking to for how long and what about how far outside of your quote unquote wheelhouse it is, and then also like you as a person with a life, and I assume that like a podcast or you know is not going to be the only you know it will take, it will take over your life if you love hobbies, free time, family, don't start a podcast, but like if you decide to do one, just try to figure out ways to like do the best thing that you can possibly make while also still preserving the life that gives you the ideas and the inspiration and you know reference points to actually have a conversation about something. Also prepping for an interview can have a lot to do with what you're trying to get. Mm -hmm. Like if it's just like like if you're like like we don't ever for example at, at Tal we don't ever really do profiles so when when we're talking to someone like you, like we have to produce for example like even though Ira is Ira Glass you still produce him. So like to produce Ira would mean you sit down with him and you talk to him about the ideas of the interview and he tells you what you're trying to get to, what we're trying to get to. And there will be questions that are designed to get you to a point. Mm -hmm. It's never just like, I'm going to ask a bunch of interesting questions and hear what the person says. Like you are actually guiding them to a place. Mm -hmm. So if you are trying to get something out of this interview, then, then yeah, you sketch out a roadmap mm -hmm. of questions. Like it's not just like, what do I think is interesting? Like it's because it also saves you a lot of time. Like, it, yeah. like it, you just don't want to ask everything. You want to ask along a roadmap to get to a place. Right. I'm also a huge fan of ignorance, actually, because I think one of the things that's true in radio is like real surprise. So, I mean, obviously, if you're talking to somebody, you have a you have a basic idea of what you want. Yeah. I'm definitely a roadmap is yeah. great, but I think some people, especially when they're new to to radio or podcasting, they feel like they need to prove their worth by showing their guests how much they already know, which is totally the wrong, you, you don't start an interview being like, I read all your books, I know everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we really have nothing to talk about. It's like, how did you get started? Like being surprised at the ways in which the conversation like moves, like actually just focusing less on what you know about the person and more on like what they're saying and your real curiosity. Mm. Like, like just be with them the way you would anyone else that you met somewhere who's interesting. You know, like have the map, but don't let it like. Yeah. Don't don't become a prisoner to it. Oh, I don't know what the precise entry point. I think maybe we. Have, I know we have a development department, and that they accept pitches. I don't know what the email address to these people is, but I believe that uh, we have a very like. That's the information I know even off the top. Of well, they head. have that new system. Remember all the, were you not there last Friday? They did a whole, <laughs> <laughs> they have it, okay. So, <laughs> we just had a meeting where they they mapped out exactly what their pitch process is and what they need from people. Have you were out? <laughs> there is a slideshow, <laughs> like a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Are you guys open pitching? Sorry. Uh, are you guys open pitch? Do people pitch openly? That yeah. Oh yeah. People pitch. People pitch. And so, like, first warning is like their development pipeline is pretty full. Like it's. Yeah. They they have like a set number of shows that they want to make and are making but they're always open to some like completely amazing idea that could be a mini series or a show. And the thing that they need, there's an email, I can give it to you after, um, but basically they want uh, like an introductory email, just like, just start, go right into it. Like, what's your idea? Like, what's the thing? Like, try to, again, do it in a way that shows that you know story, that you're a good storyteller, um, and just speak, just like write the way you would, you would 
speak it, right? Um, and then if you have any experience, like if you've made documentaries, like have a link to what you've done. If you've written stories, like have a link to that. If you have no experience whatsoever, that's fine. You need to be either a good natural storyteller or have access to a story that nobody else has access to. Um, and so, yeah, it's just one email and then they would get back to you and tell you what, what else they need from you. It would take several meetings mm -hmm. and their development timeline is, yeah, it's long and it painful. Long. Did you want to add something, Carrie? No, I mean, I think, I mean, there's several different networks. There's, um, I mentioned Panoply is one. Um, there's, I think, Pineapple. Pineapple? Yeah. Uh, there's, um, did I say Radiotopia already? Um, Radiotopia. Um, yeah, Radiotopia. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a great one. Um, what is the huge one that has, um, Earwolf? Yes. Oh, yeah, Earwolf. Earwolf is a good place uh, for talk shows, too. Yeah. And they have, and they also have a, a sort of um, like marketing, like a, uh, you know, advertising. Earwolf. Yeah. Earwolf. Yeah. Earwolf. Yeah. But don't forget all the radio stations, WNYC, NPR, all these places. I mean, it's hard yeah. to do pitch out of the blue, but they do take pictures. And that's a really good point now, because there are a lot, there was sort of like this exodus of, of you know, producers from radio into podcasting because I think most uh, public radio stations were a little bit, uh, I don't know, concerned about it. Conservative. Uh, conservative. <laughs> uh, and now they're like, oh, crap. So they're looking. They're, you know, there's a lot of projects in development and there is money. Mm -hmm. We're also taking pitches and the we provide equipment to people that create content. Um, so we have a podcast studio that we just built in the last few months, and then we have field kits that are going out to people. So if you're interested, um, you are the owner of your content. We basically distribute. We need to fill airtime. Um, so <laughs> there's much more to say, but yeah, uh, but yeah, it's a really, it's an amazing initiative. So it gives you access to actual equipment as well as if you just like, I don't know how to do this. I want to try it out. Just do it. Uh, like Brittany was saying, you know, just start doing it. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. I've got probably like 50 cards that I brought with me. Oh shit. And for people who've never been to Brick, it is incredible. Like you guys have the most amazing space, amazing facilities. Yes. It's really yes. like, yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty inspiring. It's pretty, yeah. Everybody who's, who's, everybody who's interested should be like hooking up with you guys. Yeah. And then like you get and their then shots. going from there. Yeah. And then yes. Yes. Yeah, you see, that's why I invited him. Like, you're way more apt to, to hear it. Yeah, and you, like I said, you're the owner of your content. It'll get yes. distributed, but on a few different platforms too. Oh. But you, um, you can, if it, honestly, if you want to sell it or something like that. Same thing with television. There, uh, we distribute it. You're the owner. Okay, uh, Daphne, you, you, Daph. So I want to know, like, because I decide, I produce documentaries, so in my head I'm thinking, you guys are home with little recorders, and then you go out and find the quiet spaces and interviews. Is that how some of it goes, where you just go on location with a recorder and mic people up? And, Pretty much. And then what's a typical budget to produce? If you want to produce your own what's podcast. Your Sorry? What's your Oh. I mean, you guys, that's, that's really, I mean, you can, you can make it, the project as expensive as you, as you want, but you, you know, it's the same, you know, you can also just, the equipment, you can write, you know, the, the editor, the studios, phone, it's, it's so you can do it for very little money, it's just the amount of time that you are willing to put into the project, and that can get, that can be expensive. Keep in mind, it's mostly cheaper than film. Which yeah. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Film, which, cheaper than film. Way cheaper than film. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, are you storytelling or are you storytelling? 
Oh, did you? I did an interview for director. Oh, great. So I didn't have a question. Yeah, we go. We're all over. So. Mm -hmm. Diane, do you want to answer this question? <laughs> Diane is a fellow, and that's yeah. You can. <laughs> you, it's there's all more, we have programs for people coming in, and I think everybody is right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a ton of And be yeah, and beyond that, there's actually a, a listserv called New York Public Radio. It's just a listserv that you can get on right now, and they send out emails. Like you'll get emails every day that are people looking for transcribers. So that's actually a great way. Um, we've actually hired some transcribers as interns because we would send them a three-hour interview, and they would transcribe it like beautifully on time and have really smart things to say when they returned it. Like, oh, I love that interview. Yeah, like I love that interview for this and this reason. I always pay attention to people like that. Um, and you know, it's it's definitely like depending on the show, like it's not bad money, um, and it's something you can do on your you know, and late at night, free time, whatever. And there's also things called tape syncs. Like you can go record an interview for somebody, um, like a show who's looking. It, it's, it's basically if somebody is calling from another place and they need something recorded in whatever, New York, suburbs of New York, they basically need you to go and stand, hold a mic. You'd need equipment. Um, and then the person who hired oh, you would, okay. would, would call the, call the person on the phone and basically you send them the audio and then they match it up with whatever, you know, their questions are being recorded on. So there's different, like, kind of freelance gigs that are a nice way to dip your toe in. Um, and then it'll also help you get internships when you're, like, in the summer or after you've graduated. And, and radio, uh, and it, there's a really direct line from interning to, to being staffed. Like, it, public radio is great that way. We, you know, you work with people, there's a lot of, train somebody to, you know, to sort of internalize the sound of your show, you don't really want to let them go. If there's a, a job that opens up, you want to, you, you've invested all this time into them, you want to, mm -hmm. you know, keep them around. So you're at the perfect place. Okay, yes. So for those of us who are interested in just starting out and maybe don't have a ton of access to resources or don't get one of the great setups that you that it's hard to get out of the floor. What are like, the basics that we need to get started in terms of like mics and maybe an editing program or equipment? So I always think that when like when you like the thing about podcasting is you don't know if you're gonna like it until you start doing it. Mm -hmm. And there is a chance because it is time consuming and hard and kind of painstaking work that you might not like it. So I think that you should try to spend as little money as possible when you're starting out until you actually like know whether, what's that? I can speak for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just stuff with cheap microphones, whether it's uh, uh, the, 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 the blue, the, the blue uh, what, the Yeti? The blue, or the, the, snowball? the, blue, yeah, the snowball? Yeah, the yeah. Yeti snowballs have a price. Yeah. Uh, get yourself like a wing sock or a pop. <laughs> yeah. 10 bucks. <laughs> and, and if you got a Mac, it comes with garage. Okay, perfect. So like, on set, have a garage band and well, they, my hands on the mic. There is another program that's free that like, okay, so like uh, a lot of times Audacity. industry. Audacity. Audacity. Audacity, yeah. A lot of times industry standard is Pro Tools. And I used Audacity until I started working at Gimlet. And it was really not bad for me to switch from Audacity to Pro Tools. Audition was 
is like more difficult for me to use. And there's also this program that is, it's like a Pro Tools license. I don't even know how much it costs. It's like, it's like the Maybach. I have no clue how much it costs. It's so much yeah, it's like eight 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 Right, yeah. And they also have like, I mean, I think it's kind of a nightmare that person can want to Oh, there's like a, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a cheap version of Pro Tools. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I think it's yeah. like $30. There's like, there's a version you get $30 a month for a subscription. There's also yeah. this other thing called Hindenburg, where mm -hmm. for one license, it's like $130. Mm -hmm. And I think once a year, they have it for like way, 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 yeah. way cheaper than that. Um, and there are some people who use, I know at Pineapple, a lot of, at Pineapple Studio, Pineapple Street, whatever it's called, a lot of people like to use um, Hindenburg. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I'd say Audacity is like, to me, the best free thing that you can use that's close to, like, makes it easier to switch to virtuals. Reaper too. You can download Reaper initially for free. And I, I want to, I want to watch the way I say this. They're a very kind Danish or Dutch company, so they let the license time slip, like the trial version, for a while. I think everybody. Should, I honestly, I'm saying this very honestly. I think people should get paid for their software and things like that. But you know, you can practice with it for a while. Though you know, you have that. And it's a really, really good program. R e a p e r. Lastly, uh, my two cents. I looked at um, B and H has packages for like ninety nine dollars, like the whole the whole thing, wow. mm -hmm. the, like the mice, what you need. Yeah. It doesn't come with the software, but like a Dassey and Reaper things that I've heard of. My friends who have no radio experience whatsoever, I don't even know if they've heard a podcast in their life. Their seven year old son <laughs> recorded a podcast on using his parents' iPhone. Um, and apparently downloaded like an editing software and did it. It was 15 minutes long. It's incredible how good the audio quality is. <laughs> yeah. No, really, and talk about like no barriers. Like mm -hmm. it's a nice way to, to really just like find your voice and try a bunch of stupid things. I, I, I'm gonna get that software. Yeah, your, your cell phone, like sometimes when we call people like on the, on the phone, like when we're in the studio, we call them on the phone. Like phone quality, it just comes through sometimes and it's like, mm -hmm. but sometimes what we'll do is if they are like my parents and they have a landline, then we'll have, we'll talk to them on the landline and we'll have them record themselves on an iPhone. If you're in like a small, quiet space, then it, the, the audio quality comes through really, really Is that directed to anyone? Oh, I mean, yeah, you could, you could, you could conceivably rip audio from a video file and try and cut it. The problem is, I think, um, if you're shooting something specifically with, you know, with a visual in mind, you often are not getting the kinds of, of sort of signposts that you need to be getting for, a, 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 you know, a podcast or a radio show. I mean, you can. You can listen for it. You can script around it, perhaps. So, but that's one thing just to be uh, really uh, aware of. But what, what would be the difference if, it's, if a person wanted to do a talk show versus someone that's interviewing people? Aren't it, isn't it some of the same? That say, if I was interviewing these people in my own living room. Mm -hmm. I think she's well, saying she if it's an interview, then she doesn't need. It's not. I don't I, I, yeah, what? Need to show the people. The no, you don't. No, I, I mean, I think that it. I think that the the content. Oh, so you haven't shot anything yet? No, I have. You have. Okay. What I would do. What What I would do is I would listen to it, and I would then I would listen specifically for those moments where somebody gestures. And. You know, you don't have anything on tape. You can't, you can't use that whole sentence, or you know what I mean. It's like you have to then figure out where you're going to find that answer somewhere else. So you it, it, uh, often, if um, 
I think that I'm trying to think of what there was a radio program uh, that that did this and had some trouble, tr you know, using the actual uh, video to, to then create the radio program, uh, and I think it was Frontline, uh, and they, they had to do several different pilots so that they could figure out like how to how to remember to get the information that you need for audio that you're not necessarily picking up on your video. So, mm -hmm. um, so then I guess my question is, if someone was doing a podcast, what would be the difference in interviewing just a bunch of celebrities for a podcast? If you're asking them questions, what's the difference as opposed to having them visually? Isn't it basically the mm -hmm. same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how are people listening to you too? Keep that in mind. Keep the intimacy in mind. Um, I, I, what what I'm hearing is this: is that one of the things about when I when you know that you're being taped, there's a language that you are able to. Um, there's a shorthand of language that you're able to use because you know that the person can see you. But in um, in podcasting or radio, there that's not there. So just as I'm using my hands to kind of like illustrate what I'm talking about, if I stop talking, you know what I'm saying because you know you saw me, right? But you don't have that in um, radio. So then there's this space where she's talking about like, okay, so then what are you going to say? Are you going to say, then Anjanette did wave her hands a bunch of times. You know, you either have to fill that in so that the listener understands what's happening or cut it out yeah. and then if you cut it out as you well you know then it don't make sense or it, or it might not make sense to, I mean, so can you talk to that that's kind of what i'm hearing so it's just really just about you need to cut it i'm just jumping in here you probably just need to cut it and see if it makes sense because like that's the same thing with documentaries that we are challenged by I transcribe it, it sounds awesome. I put it together, I'm like, oh, this is terrible. This is awful. The person doesn't really answer the question in the same way because they whispered instead of, you know, like the first part, I try to cut something together, first part of it is loud, and then they whisper the rest. I can't use it, you know? So I think that since you already have the material, hey, what is it to do? We have, we're in the age of nonlinear editing now. It's not like the old days, you know, where you have to do with it, this and that. So I, I think that you probably have the material there. It just would be like what they were talking about, like the editing over and over and over so that it gets like really crisp and to the point. So has anyone up there ever done an interview podcast? How would you describe this? How do you set it up? Um, depending, depending on how many mics. Um, and I think you guys do a lot of interviews too, right? Yeah. Um, I had I uh, I've worked on a number of uh, interview podcasts, and um, it's pretty straightforward setup. It's always better, I think, if they can be together. Um, uh, are you the interviewer? Yeah. Um, you know, you need a mic for everybody there. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a pretty straightforward setup. Most handheld recorders are, have stereo capacity, so you can just turn one channel all the way to the left and one channel all the way to the right, and then have them on two separate tra uh, tracks-ish, so you can edit them. Um, it, it's not an expensive setup at all. Uh, but keep them close, I think would probably be my, you know, again, the, the, the best advice I could give you is, it, I'm. I have to pitch my voice in a certain way that kind of strips it of intimacy because I'm speaking to you across the table and, you know, 10 feet or 20 feet. So if you're going to have an intimate conversation, make sure that you're close. Okay, our last question. All right, so stay on the topic of interview. Um, I just recently watched Shit Town, and there was a, not to spoil anything, but there was a conversation that Brian had. But then he like kept in the part where he was like, oh, I'm going to call you back from the studio. So they were having this intimate conversation. Like, how do you remember having this authenticity, but then he was like, oh, I'm going to take this recorder in your face at the same time? 
I mean, what you heard is exactly what it was. I mean, that's what, I mean, Brian is a pro and he knew that anything could be of value in that moment. And so as much as it might be awkward to do that thing that he did, he did it, you know? And it's like, you do run the risk of somebody being like, that's inappropriate or whatever, but like, that's the game. You know, you want to get stuff on tape and like, you want to get it on tape well, you know? And like the studio's just better. Mm-hmm. No, it's not takes. I mean, uh, I, I've seen I've seen Ira do this thing that I've, I just wish I he does this thing where he like asks the same question like um, a bunch of times in different ways to get the answer he wants. And it's like I haven't figured this science out, but it's like um, it's like it, but it's like you don't do it in a row. You don't be like you, you come back to it like you circle back if you didn't get like but you have to be aware that you didn't get what you yes. wanted. So then you just kind of keep that in mind, you reformulate the question, you ask a bunch of other things, and then you come back to that and you ask it a different way. And if it doesn't work that time, you try it again. And it's like, you, you know, I've seen him like make, like it's like you'll give up after like five or six times, but it's like a, it's like a tactic. But the beauty of that, and, and this is I think, might even answer some of your question, the difference between like interviewing for a podcast versus like TV, it's like, Sometimes you'll interview somebody who's written a book and they're a beautiful talker and you put a mic in front of them and they're saying lyrical things that they've written, but that you don't hear the heart in it. And the way to do it, the way to get them to say it with heart is to just, I don't understand. Like, can you explain that to me again? Or like ask the same question twice or like move away and then ask it again. Or like, is this what you're saying? And then like totally say the wrong thing and have them be like, no, this is what I'm saying. It's just... Like, when you don't have a visual and you're just listening, you can hear the person, like you said, like, thinking something through, trying to find the right words. Like, if you ask somebody, how did they feel when that happened, their first answer would be like, oh, I felt happy. But, like, what does that mean? Like, describe happy to me. Like, give me a picture. Like, they have to be so vivid in their descriptions that you get the movie in your head, right? And that's the big challenge, I It's think. sometimes very counterintuitive to ask, to ask, to have to ask somebody something super obvious. Like, you know, it's like, oh, my mother just died. And then to say like, well, how do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, seems like a dumb question, but you didn't have them say how they felt about it until mm-hmm. they say it. Like, it's not, the assumption doesn't work on the radio. I had to interview this guy the other day who worked at this record company like 20 years ago. And I was asking him about his boss, who is this guy who's like this record executive or whatever. And like, I've read this, like the guy who I'm trying to ask about, I read his autobiography. Like I've read tons of interviews about him, blah, 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 blah. And he's somebody who kind of like, you know, he kind of like makes him, like, you know, like any super professional CEO person does. They're just like, oh, okay, this is the sliver of me you will get and everything else I'm going to keep for myself. But like, so I was talking to somebody who used to work with him like 20, 30 years ago. And like, I just kept asking him about the same story about somebody's album cover over and over and over again. And while I was doing it, I was like, this person hates me so much. <laughs> I know you hate me so much. But the thing was, is that I kept asking him, because actually so the, the host of Shruti's show, PJ, I had like talked to me about how to approach this interview before I talked to this guy. And he said the story about Ira asking the same thing over and over again. So I was like, okay, be like Ira, be like Ira. It's so <laughs> awkward. But then, like, you know, I, I like ended up running the interview probably seven minutes over time. But like the last 10 minutes that I had with him were like when I finally asked him, I was like, this man's gonna hang up on me. Like, I cannot believe that I'm asking this question again. But like he like he just like broke and he gave me like two really good stories in a row. And then he gave me like the phone numbers of three other people to talk to. So like with, like the the cool thing is that like I lucked out because that was the first time that I had ever tried to do that because I'm I'm not like I've been podcasting for a while but I'm new to like interviewing people and like it feels I'm not like that I'm not as seasoned at like interviewing people for information I mean you're interviewing someone when you know that you're being recorded like when you're having a conversation with somebody that you know is just gonna be cut down into a shorter conversation you like talk in a certain way it's like a little bit more like jazzy mm-hmm. when you're talking to someone just like. Okay, so just explain to me again this thing. Like, you're going to obviously cut some of yourself out. You're just trying to get them to say the thing they need to say. It does feel really, really weird. And it doesn't make you feel like a normal person having, like, a regular cool conversation. And, like, normally when you're talking to people, you want them to like you. So you're going to act 
normal. But like, you, you just have to literally just do the opposite yeah. of what you would do if you wanted someone to like yeah. you. You can do all kinds of tricks too. You can also ingratiate yourself by saying something personal. This is the thing that like Ira also does is like come into an interview and say something revealing, not that revealing, but like enough where the person feels like there's an exchange happening. I mean, you know, there's stuff you've learned to do over time. And I think also sometimes you you hear as after you really get going, you hear when you're like, that answer is not going to work. Like, you you know, you can already start to edit it and you're like, I'm going to have to ask that one again. <laughs> you know, so you're like prepped in your mind. Just keep in mind that the worst thing is when you realize after something is done that you did not get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. That's the yes. worst feeling is when you come out like empty handed. Yeah. And you hear these shows and I think like there's there's great conversation shows where like the person talks to someone for an hour and then puts up the hour and it's great. But a lot of these produced shows like I can't even imagine how much tape shit town had that they did not use, right? Like we we have a calculation which is a bullshit cal calculation, but it's like we will spend 3 hours talking to somebody and end up using like 1 minute, you know? And it's it's just you just you, it's like a marathon. You just keep talking until you know you have the bare minimum. Yeah, when, you, when we book a studio for an interview, it's almost always two hours, an hour and a half, two hours. I've never yeah. put a two hour interview on the air anyway, like under yeah. any circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, yo, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> this is supposed to be over. Okay, so um, we're gonna have to um, stop it there. But please, by all means, you know, come and talk to our panelists. Thank you so much, Neil, Mark, Brittany, Harry. <laughs>